Welcome back to the Learn WGPU tutorial series. Today we're going to be talking about textures and bind groups. So we've already talked about bind groups a little bit in the past and in previous videos, but today we're going to talk about getting images or textures that we can map onto the triangles that we're painting on the screen, because this is typically the way that you get higher resolution or really nice looking games. The tutorial talks a little bit about the various kinds of textures or images that we can have. For example, there are normal maps or bump maps that control how light glances off a texture. So we don't just have to have an image on a flat plane. We can have an image on a flat plane that affects the rendering of light that hits it from our scene. In this tutorial, we're gonna talk about diffuse maps. There's also a similar concept called albedo, A-L-B-E-D-O. My understanding is that older models use these diffuse maps which try to include some diffuse lighting into the texture, while more modern physically-based rendering systems try to use the albedo more, uh, which is the pure color of the texture or object that you're trying to replicate. The tutorial gives us an image to use, so I downloaded this into our project. In this case, it's happytree.png in my source folder. So here we need to include the image crate in our dependencies. They use version 0.24, so we'll see what version we get. We need to turn the default features off. I'm not sure why. And we also need to enable both the PNG and the JPEG features. I'm not sure why we need the JPEG features because I don't think we use a JPEG file, but we can add that image crate using cargo add image with the no default features flag and the dash F flags for PNG and JPEG. And if we scroll through, we can see that we've enabled the JPEG and the PNG features for image V 0.24.3. They talk a little bit about JPEGs here, but I am not sure why we're talking about a JPEG because the image that they give us is a PNG. So I don't know if they want us to convert this for the web or not. Um, it seems like using this approach in Wasm performantly is an exercise left to the reader. So if we want to do that, we can, um, but it's not going to affect the functionality. It will only affect the performance of our implementation where the most performant version is uh, letting the browser download and parse the image itself using an image tag. And the less performant version is doing all of the like downloading and parsing inside of our Wasm code. So inside of our new function right near the bottom, right where we configure our surface, I'll drop in these new pieces of code. In this case, we use the include bytes macro to pull in uh, happytree.png. If we pull up the types for this, you can see that the Included PNG is a byte slice, so it's an array of U8s. Then we use the image crate to load uh, from memory. So we just pulled in these bytes. So these bytes are going to be included with our binary whenever we build this project, which means that we'll be able to copy those in and or reference them and load the image that we want from this byte slice. So from this region of memory, we choose to interpret this image as an RGBA8. And then it looks like we also just grab the dimensions. So the image crate offers us this function to grab the dimensions out, which will be a tuple of U32s for the width and the height. Now, if you've never seen the use item uh, used in this location, it is possible. Uh, you can use the use item in many different places, not just at the top of a file. Uh, that's because the use item is not an import. If you're used to something like JavaScript's module system or something like that, this is not a import this for the file. So we don't have to stick it at the top of the file. What this will do for us is bring generic image view into scope, but only at this point. So you can do this for things like enums if you don't wanna type uh, like the enum name colon colon the variant over and over and over. A little bit less common Rust syntax, but it is possible and you can totally do it this way. Then we're told to create a texture. In this case, we use the WGPU extent 3D type. This extent 3D type is the same extent 3D that we use in Bevy. So you've got a width, a height, and a depth, or the array layers. So this third field can be used for either the depth of a 3D texture, or it can be used for the array layers of an array texture, a 2D array texture, which we've covered in previous videos. In this case, we have uh, a PNG with a width, a PNG with a height, and then there's only one layer or one depth, so it's a 2D texture. We use our device, which is the GPU, to create this texture using the familiar descriptor pattern. And there's a note here in the tutorial that all textures are stored as 3D, 
but we represent our 2D texture by setting the depth to one, which we have done above in our extent 3D. The texture size is the extent 3D that we just created. We haven't talked about MIP levels yet or MIP maps, and the tutorial doesn't seem to actually tell us much about this. So dimensionally, we're creating a 2D texture. So we want this uh, texture to be interpreted as 2D, which we have types for. So in this case, we get a texture dimension of D2. This could be D1, D2, or D3. The format is an sRGB format for the RGB8. And we have two usage flags here. One is texture binding and the other is copy DST. Texture binding allows us to bind it to our shaders so that we can pass the data in through the bind groups. Copy DST is so that we can copy data into this texture. And then we give it a label. In this case, it's called diffuse texture, but it, it could be anything. Then right below that, we can use the Q to write the texture in. So we've got an image copy texture. We set our texture to the image that we just set up. We set the MIP level to zero. We still haven't gone over MIPs, so I'm just gonna skip that. We set a 3D origin for this texture, which is all zeroed out, so X, Y, Z is zero, zero, zero. If we go to the docs for image copy texture, we can find out more information. So this is the WGPU docs and for image copy texture, which is a type alias. So we can tell that because it's pub type. And then this is an image copy texture base with a texture that lives for some lifetime. It also points us to a place in the spec in case we want to read like the really nitty gritty of what this represents. And this is actually where we find out where what aspect is. So if we click on this GPU texture aspect, we can see all stencil only or depth only. In this case, using anything other than all seems to restrict the capabilities a little bit. And we aren't using uh, stencils or depth textures here. We're using an actual like full on image. So setting this to all allows us to copy all the aspects of the data. Then for right texture, we do have to pass in the actual pixel data. So the bytes that we took in earlier, and then we set up the layout of the actual texture itself. So offset zero, which means our data starts at the beginning of the pixel data. We have to set the bytes per row and the rows per image. So the rows per image is going to be our height. So it's dimensions dot one, which is the, the height of our image from earlier and the bytes per row specifically because we're using an RGBA8, so a U8 basically, which is one byte. If we are going to have an R channel, a G channel, a B channel, and an A channel, that means we have four U8s or four bytes for every pixel in our image. So we're doing four bytes times the width of the image gives us the total number of bytes in each row. We continue uh, using more of the diffuse texture code in this case, it's quite wide, so I wanted to bring it up to a full screen. We need to define a way to view the texture inside of our shader, as well as a sampling methodology. So in this case, we use the default texture view descriptor, which I believe will give us a, like a 2G view descriptor. We'll see as we progress in this tutorial a little bit. And then we also have to create a sampler. So in this case, the address mode is kind of like what happens when you get to the edge of an image. So you can see that we are defining clamp to edge for all of them, but we can also clamp to the border or we can repeat or we can repeat by flipping the image over. So instead of, um, if you have the image in front of you and you get to the right edge, you will flip the image over and copy it onto the right hand side of the original image. So you'll go from zero to one for the X value coordinate of the image. And then as you continue, you'll go from one to zero. So mirrored repeat. In this case, clamp to edge will cause, if we sample sort of outside of our texture, what we'll end up with is like that one pixel streak at the end of the image. And here we have an example of what each of those means for the address modes. So clamp to edge, when we get to define this uh, in the X direction, the Y direction, and the Z direction, which if we look at the code is defined as U, V, and W, not X, Y, and Z, but you can think of them as X, Y, and Z. So clamp to edge gets us that one pixel streak. So at the bottom of the image, it just takes whatever the last pixel was and repeats it all the way down to the bottom or all the way to the right. A repeat will repeat the same texture over and over. So we get from zero to one and then zero to one over and over. And mirrored repeat is what we were talking about earlier, where if we go, uh, let's, let's talk about the Y dimension. So if we go from one to zero, then we sample outside of that, we'll go from zero to one for the next sort of segment of image. So if we had a 400 pixel high image and we sampled at 399 or 400, we would get the base of the tree. 
if we sample on the other side at 401, we're into the second image, but we also get the base of the tree because it was mirrored vertically. It is possible to view a texture on some geometry or something from really, really close or really, really far away. So this defines how we sample from that image when a single fragment either covers um, a full set of pixels as well as what happens if a fragment covers a fraction of a pixel. And of course, you probably want this to behave differently, whether it's one case or the others. We get two options here. Uh, in one case, we do a linear blend, or if we have fragments that are fractions of a pixel, we can kind of reach to the nearest pixel and pick that color and use it. Again, we don't cover MIP maps here. I don't know if we cover MIP maps ever. I don't think we do. So maybe that will be an extension to the series because I don't think these tutorials ever talk about MIP maps, even though we do have to set like MIP map filters and things like that. We, of course, uh, keep dumping more code into this new function. So we're at quite a bit of code for this tutorial. We're at 178 here. So almost 100 lines of code for setting up this texture. In this case, we're setting up the bind group layout, which we've set up bind group layouts before. In this case, we use the familiar descriptor pattern to create the bind group layout. We have two bindings, a binding zero and a binding with an ID of one, both available to the fragment shader. And this is something that you'll often see when it comes to textures or passing images to your shaders. We have binding zero or the first binding be the actual uh, texture view. And then we have a sampler as the second binding. And typically, if you want to get a pixel from a texture, you'll end up using something like the texture view. So for example, if we have a texture that is a 2D texture, and this is the WGSL spec because I <laughs> didn't mention that before I started talking. Um, if we have a texture that's a 2D texture, like we do currently, and we have a sampler for that texture, and we have some coordinates, then we can use the texture sample function to grab the relevant uh, pixel data out of that texture using the sampler at these coordinates. So that's why we have these two bindings here, one of which is the texture and one of which is the sampler. And then we dump in more code here. <laughs> it's a lot, a lot of copy and pasting happening. We use the device to create the bind group. So in this case, this data really isn't going to change for us. So we can create it when we create our state. Uh, so this will be the same data that we send in to uh, the bind group that has the layout that we just created. We again use the bind group descriptor pattern. The layout is the layout we just created above with the texture view and the sampler. And we say bind group entry zero is a binding resource that's a texture view. And we pass in our texture view. Remember our texture view up here is the diffuse texture create view call that we had earlier that creates the texture view. And then our sampler is the diffuse sampler, which we also created earlier and is the uh, way to sample or is where we defined the way that we want to sample if we select outside of the texture. Now, the reason the bind group and the bind group layout, even though they look so similar, are separate is because we can actually swap out the bind groups for any given layout that matches. So this is a layout that represents what our shader is actually going to get. And then if we wanted to, we could create multiple bind groups to send different data at different times to the shaders. And in our state return, I'm going to drop in this diffuse bind group that we just created while we're down here. And then I'll go back up to our state struct and add the WGPU bind group type as the diffuse bind group. And then right after we set up our pipeline, we'll set our bind group. So it's going to be bind group zero. It's going to be the diffuse bind group that we just set up and set up. And then we get to continue with our vertex buffer and the index buffer and the draw calls. Then in the render pipeline, again, a render pipeline is the combination of the bind group layouts, the bind groups and the shader information. So it's basically the full package that we need to run a program on the GPU inside of bind group layouts. We are going to want to use a uh, texture bind group layout. So in this case, I don't think that we have this in the right order. So it just had us dump all of this code below surface.configure, but we need access to the texture bind group layout that we created like all the way down here. So we need access here to device queue, and that's pretty much it. So I'm gonna copy all of that. Here's the render pipeline, there's a config, there's the render pipeline layout. And then right above our shader, after we define device and queue, I'm going to paste in that code because we need to access that variable earlier in our program than the tutorial made it seem like we needed to. So I just needed to move it up so that in our render pipeline layout, 
this texture bind group layout is available to us. We just did all this work to create it. It would be a shame if we <laughs> couldn't actually use it. So we've been using vertex colors up until this point. So our vertexes or vertices uh, array here is a vertex with a position that is a VEC3 of F32s and a color that was a VEC3 of F32s. We are going to change this. I'm going to call this texture. Well, I'll call it the same thing as the tutorial does just for clarity. Uh, but this is texture coordinates. So it's like an X, Y value that we're going to use to sample the actual texture. So we've taken our uh, VEC here down from a VEC3 to a VEC2. And then in our impl vertex for this vertex attribute array, our second value is now a float 32 by two. And I've replaced the vertices list. So we still have five vertices. We're still building a pentagon. The positions are still the same, but the texture coordinates now are different. So I'm not a huge fan of the fact that we had to, like we aren't generating this from something feels a little awkward because we have to get these like arbitrary texture coordinates out of this. But basically we're going to assume that the tutorial correctly identified all of the individual pixel look or like the uh, device coordinate locations and stuff. So we'll just assume that these X, Y values are accurate for us. One thing that is worth noting is that these are not uh, like U32s. They're not integers. We're looking at something between zero and one for our texture size. So no matter how big our image texture is, if we have a value between zero and one, uh, zero, zero is in like the top left and one, one is in the bottom right. And we can choose any place that an F32 allows us to specify between those two points. This is why we want to use a sampler because as you might imagine, if we were to manually construct a, like a hash map or an object, or whatnot of like a 2D grid with all of the X and Y positions as integers or something, we would have to then exactly match all of those keys if we were going to grab a value out from the texture. But what we want to do is be able to just like specify some spot in this PNG and have our sampler be like, okay, what texture, what, what pixel value should this actually be? Like what value should I return? Um, which is why we do this like um, more complicated sampler and view setup rather than doing something where it's like, okay, I'm going to grab that pixel or this pixel. If we go into our shader, our vertex input now changes from color to text coordinates, texture coordinates, which is a VEC2 of F32s. Same again for the output, which is a VEC2 of F32s. And then we change the output to match. So we've changed the field in our inputs and outputs. So in our output, we need to set output.texture coordinates. And in this case, we use our input texture coordinates to pass that from the vertex shader to the fragment shader. So this is where we see our bind groups. So we set up the bind group layouts, we set up the bind groups, and this is where we actually get to use them. In this case, we've got group zero binding zero. If we look at the render pipeline and the specifically the render pipeline layout and the bind group layouts array, we can see that our texture bind group layout is set as the zero indexed bind group or the first bind group. That's why we have group zero here. And then this binding ID for binding zero or binding one comes from when we're setting up the diffuse bind group itself. So we've got the texture bind group layout with a binding of zero and a binding of one for the texture view and the fragment or the, the sampler. And that's why this is group zero because we set it up in the render pipeline binding zero because we set it up in the bind group layout. And then WGSL has a couple of types that we can use for these automatically. So uh, this is going to be called T diffuse for whatever reason. I think they're trying to say texture diffuse here, but it's going to be a texture 2D type and it's going to be um, indexed by F32s. So our X and Y value are going to be an F32 to get a value out of this. And then we have our sampler. So that's S diffuse with a sampler type. And we can see this texture sample that we talked about earlier from the WGSL spec. This texture sampler or this texture sample function takes the texture 2D as the first argument, the sampler as the second argument, and the XY coordinates as a VEC2 for the third argument. And this returns us a pixel value. And if we run our program right now, we see an upside down tree inside of our Pentagon. So we've correctly identified um, sort of all of the vertices and triangles to create our Pentagon. And then on top of that, we've, out of this texture that we've set up, we've sampled 
all of the fragments inside of this pentagon against that texture. So you can think of this if you're uh, still having trouble mapping uh, like textures and fragments and things like that. You can think of this as if there were a box here surrounding this pentagon. In the top left over here would be 0, 0. And in the bottom right over here would be 1, 1. And then we're taking the x, y values for every pixel inside of that box. For the ones that are outside of our geometry, they're just gone. We don't care about them. For the ones that are inside of the geometry we've defined, we pick all of those individual pixel values. We sample those out of the texture. We take those values and we map them into uh, the output. Now, the texture is supposed to be upside down at this point. That's because the tutorial wants to point out that the y-axis is inverted. So 0, 0 in the top left, 1, 1 in the bottom right, like we talked about earlier. So there's a conflict because WGPU has 1 at the top, while the texture coordinates have 1 at the bottom. So if you think about that from bottom to top, if we're laying out something like vertices, we can go sort of from 0 in the middle to 1 at the top and negative 1 at the bottom. If we are looking at our image, our image is laid out in a different way using a different coordinate system. So the bottom would be one and the top would be zero, which is the exact opposite from the way that we're laying out our vertices. So what we end up doing to fix that here is we flip the Y index. So we're gonna do basically one minus these values. And because these are all hard coded, we're just gonna replace them with the actual values. So in this case, we get 0.992. So you can see that if we've got 0 0.992 here, the resulting value is going to be something like 0 0.0075. And we can see that these roughly line up with all of these vertices values. So if we change this, we get these 1 minus y coordinate values that we are now hard coding in for the texture coordinates. Usually these aren't going to be hard coded for you. In something like Bevy, Bevy will handle kind of setting them up for you in many ways. But in this case, we've decided to just dump in a bunch of magic numbers. So it is what it is. And we can see that if we run our program now, we do get a right side up tree because we've reversed the Y coordinate. So instead of being upside down, it is now right side up. So at this point, it's fine. They want to do a refactor here. Um, I'm going to commit this code and then I'll come back after I've refactored it and show you what changed. Okay, so I've done the refactor. Here's the image of the tree to prove that everything is still working. The biggest change here was we included the anyhow crate, which is one of the crates that you can use for um, more application level or library or specific library level error handling. Earlier in the tutorial, we were using unwrap. So the tutorial, when it told us to pull this out, it did it just like basically in a huge chunk. It said, um, if I scroll all the way down here, it basically said, here's a huge chunk of code, just copy and paste it into a new file. So the changes that were made that I can tell uh, easily are we now pass in references to the device in the queue. We pass in the bytes for the image and we pass in a label for the image. And then the other huge change is that we're using question marks to return an error if there is an error. So in this case, there's an error from uh, image load from memory. And that I think is the, actually the only, that's the only question mark. So in this case, we didn't really need anyhow because there's only one error happening in this entire code block. Whatever error this load from memory uh, function returns is the error that we could have used right here. So I'm just not going to talk about anyhow at all because it's almost completely irrelevant. Uh, there, This is going to be a result type, right? So it'll be dynamic image if I, take away the question mark, it'll be a result dynamic image image error. So this could have been a result dynamic image image error, and it should have functioned the same as long as we imported everything correctly. So this is really strange to me. There's no explicit returns and no question marks for this whole function. So from image returns a result self, but really this is always going to succeed. So if we take away all of this, we get from error or from image. And if we remove anyhow from scope, everything seems like it's good. And to prove that's true, here's the running program with the uh, code that I just updated. So anyhow, in this case, isn't gaining us anything because we only have one error to handle and we could have just put that error in our result type here. So I'm not sure why they did that. Maybe they're thinking ahead and uh, whatnot. But I just wanted to point out that 
we made some like functional changes around the error handling and stuff like that that didn't really get explained in the tutorial um that are also kind of irrelevant because we also could have just unwrapped here we were already unwrapping anyway so if we're going to panic originally we could have also panicked here but we didn't we pulled in anyhow so this texture rs is just the exact same code otherwise that we just created in this tutorial with the extent 3d the texture descriptors uh the sampler and so on we have this temporary texture struct that we use to actually return this value uh from this function and then we have from bytes and from image we use mod texture to make sure that that texture rs file gets picked up by rest module system so that's in lib.rs here and we add a texture texture as a diffuse texture to our state this diffuse texture then we leave in this include bytes and we call from bytes from our texture um implementation which does the same thing it did before just to be clear and then in our diffuse bind group we also update that to be a uh, diffuse texture dot view and dot sampler which are fields on our texture struct here and then in state we have to also return diffuse texture so it's a little bit uh i guess disorienting it's not the way that i would have done the tutorial but i want to make it clear that this did not fundamentally change the code that we just went over it just looks a bit different now and is in a different spot and just to prove that this is still working in wasm even though uh, we didn't do the performance modifications that were left as an exercise to the reader we can see it running here in our browser so i hope that you enjoyed this video i will see you in the next one and if you have any questions as usual uh you can ask them in the comments